Gitu. Hi Jenny. Hey, how are you? Very well. Good evening and, and thanks for making time. It's so nice that we finally managed to make this. <laughs> I, I have to apologize because it's been me that like two or three times I've asked, can we do this some other time? Because it's it's been actually the, it's the first recording in this series since I stopped recording in the middle of last summer because I started to get lost in work and actually lost some of the recordings on a hard drive oh, yeah. for a while. And I found them again. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> and so, and I, I started that. posting them today. And so this, by the time this will be posted, um, the, 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 the gap in between will be filled. But that, that was one of the reasons why the, the Voices of the Regeneration series was stopped for a bit. And thanks for, for being patient. But it's good that you've started it again, because I think they were very popular. I certainly watched, I've watched several of them twice. Um, you know, because they're, they're fantastic to dig into. There's always something that you can learn from each person that you speak to. And you've got such a massive network of connections that have that have built different parts of the regeneration rising. So it's, it's always fun to dig in and listen whenever you've got time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a real decision to um, A, not do another podcast be not do what every marketing advisor tells you to do like keep it to three to six to maximum nine minutes don't ever dare do something like 60 minutes or 90 minute rambling conversations with people just having two talking heads but yeah of course you don't get ten thousands of views but but that's not the point of it it's yeah. it's the those people who really appreciate um kind of listening in on two friends having a conversation and that's the spirit of, yeah. of this like I, well, I, love I guess I must be naturally nosy so mm -hmm. I like listening in <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, I love the, the regenesis notion of um, friends in the work and, yeah. and that's like I extend it to a, a wider network of people that I believe are, are, are trying to live into this regenerative notion and um, and uh, yeah I, th that's the tone that I would like to, to the, these conversations to have and that's that's why for me it's also always really important to invite people to to kind of tell their story from the heart place, from the sort of what what really touched your heartstrings, or where there are points in your life where where suddenly a, a transformation occurred. Like, how, how did you become the the Jenny we we all know and love? Oh, <laughs> that's a bit of a big question. So uh, I don't know if I can answer that. But just as a quick sideways swerve, because I'm kind of used to doing that, is I was in Jersey last week. Mm -hmm. Um, for a project which has been going on for a couple of years, which is an island identity project. And the opening um, first speaker of the day was a guy who's a poet called The Story Beast. Mm -hmm. And he told the story of Jersey from Big Bang through to modern day, right throughout all of the different ages of Pliocene dinosaurs and in 10 minutes. And I, I swear he didn't miss out a thing. There was culture, the cultural history, the biological history, the geological history, the economic history. And I was thinking as I was listening to him, wow, could, could, I, could I tell my own story in 10 minutes flat? Because he, he didn't miss a thing. Um, and actually, I, I think I probably could if I really worked hard at it. But I was... You know, I was really thinking about it from the perspective of how you describe the biocultural uniqueness of place. So it's thinking if I if I had to, even in three seconds flat, what would what what is the essence of Jenny that has traveled with me since I was small to where I am today? And I, I guess I'd probably pick maybe just three words. So I pick challenge. I pick change, and then I probably pick something that is around expansion and, and, and stretch. But if you wanted to be really dull about it, you'd call it adding value. Um, and I and I guess those are those are three things. If you're really talking about the essence of a person, that what's really in your soul, and and without which you couldn't possibly be yourself um that that has woven like a red thread throughout your life those would be right at the heart of me that's beautiful because 
if you really just just sort of pause yourself in, and you reflect if somebody invited you to find three words yeah. for where we're at right now yeah they could quite easily be the same words um yeah, maybe. What, what, what we're facing and maybe that's also how because i i mean from I'm partially interested in a little more detail of of the little. What the, that the, looks like. I, I remember. I remember John Macy once in the in the mountains um, of um, Madrid um, in two thousand and two or something three. When I asked her whether, whether I should get back into academia and do a PhD, yeah. had already got a master's, and, and and she said, "I think it would be really good for you." And 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 she used this this metaphor. She said, "It'll put another string on your harp, and it will be a very useful one." And um, and I know that you have so many strings that it's every time we we just like you sometimes rattle them off and I go whoa you've done all this so so a little bit more more okay. detail on the, the the strands you now can pull together in your work. Uh, okay, so where did where did things begin? So like okay, ten in less than ten minutes, completely flat out. So like most kids or many kids, a uh, completely nature mad child. Mm -hmm. All I wanted to be when I was growing up was either Jacques Cousteau's assistant, or I wanted to go out to Africa and work with George and Joy Adamson and save lions. Um, but I was born to parents who were pretty poor in Brixton which is a south of south part of london and the question of you know what do you want for christmas what do you want for your birthday jenny was always a pony a pony never got a pony um so i was a very very nature connected child i would abscond from school and go up onto the top of epsom downs which is a race course you catch a bus and go down there watch the horses training and lay in the grass and have conversations with the sun which is probably why my eyes are so bad right now, because that was not a good thing to do as a child. Um, but I was always, I was always up for a challenge, even as a child, and I was always a challenging child. You know, I can remember saying, you know, getting getting to be being told, do as I tell you, as a six and seven year old, and sort of saying, well, why would I do that? So, you know, you're you don't have an education, mum. So why would I do that? You know, can you imagine having that kind of a child in the house? That was a nightmare. And as a, a as a teenager, I really, I guess I, I really wanted to be a vet. I wanted to go to vet school. Um, but I also was a bit of a terrorist as a teenager. You know, I was expelled twice. I was extreme, you know, I was very challenging of authority. And my parents really didn't agree that a veterinary career was what would suit um, a young girl. They were they were very working class. They were they didn't get an education. An aspiration in the sixties, early seventies was for a profession, a teacher, a doctor, and I didn't really want to be any of those. So we had a bit of a dust up about what I would do at university. And instead of going straight to university, I just packed a bag and I took off. So my first role, really, which actually, when I look back with hindsight, embodied a hell of a lot of things that I absolutely love, was working for Julius Nyerere, who was the president of Tanzania at the time. I'd gone off to Africa and hitchhiked from Cape Town to Cairo and stopped off in Tanzania on the way um, and went to work for him in the Nordic countries, um, supporting bilateral aid programs, which at the time out of the Scandinavian countries to Tanzania, which was a real social experiment in Africa, was, was huge. So we were doing things like building uh, schools, uh, agricultural irrigation programs. And, you know, I go back now and I'm very sad to see that so much promise and potential that was there has only really still partially been fulfilled but I did that for five years and it was an amazing time I learned I really learned a lot from him as a human being um, I made a lot of connections uh, across Africa with the ANC that you know I was always quite activist in the anti-apartheid movement in the UK got arrested several times for demonstrating outside the South African Embassy and actually eventually in later years in the 80s 90s I did a lot of work on the Free Nelson Mandela campaign and then on truth and reconciliation in South Africa. I, I still I still remember 
going to London as a as a teenager and always going to Trafalgar Square to the yeah. South African yeah. Embassy and just spending an afternoon with the, the yeah. people have forgotten this that the for, no, for no, years, it, it, every well, day twenty four seven there there was yeah. a vigil uh -huh. yeah and and it was a really strong community that stuck together through thick and thin to try and pull down apartheid over many decades. Um, and, and actually, I'm still really strongly connected to a, a lot of those people. We stayed friends and, you know, stayed in contact as much as you can in the modern world. Um, but, but I didn't stay in international development. I came back to the UK and after I got divorced for the first time, um, didn't have a clue what I was going to do with myself. And a big PR company offered me a job. And I didn't even know what PR was, you know, it's so like I didn't know how to spell it, I didn't know what it stood for, but they offered me a job so I took it and found that though I had no formal training, I was actually quite good at it. I, I should say aside that while I was in Sweden, I actually did my first degree, but that's another story. Um, and, you know, I was working for uh, big IT companies like IBM running those accounts and but I didn't, I just didn't want to stay inside a big organization. I just didn't feel I was cut out for it. I always felt that, you know, the, the challenge to me was, you know, I wanted to get out and do something of my own. So I left and set up my own agency in the mid eighties and stayed with that for more than 15, 16 years before I sold it back to the same organization. And during that period of time, I suppose we were one of the first brand agencies in the UK um, or Europe really that was working with what I would describe as more purpose oriented brands long before like purpose was a thing. Um, so Patagonia were one of my first clients in the mid eighties. And that was even, that was before they had got to a point of even discovering that in their supply chain, the colors that they used to dye their snap teas were using formaldehyde and pretty toxic. So I, I did all of that journey with them, companies like Timberland, uh, Levi's, so, so brand, household brand names. And the job was always pretty much working with what I describe as challenger brands. So not the number one brands that were right out there, but those that were growing. So our job was storytelling to grow global brands. But ideally, brands that had something more about them um, who were stepping into sustainability which was very new then stepping into corporate social responsibility that was new and again I was very very lucky I learned a lot from Yvonne Chouinard I learned a lot I did a lot of work for Richard Branson at Virgin I learned a lot from Jeffrey Schwartz at Timberland so I had some really good mentors that showed me it was possible in business to grow, but what Carol Sanford would call do good as well. So I, I guess I was at the beginning of the do good paradigm, a do more good paradigm, if you like. And, you know, I loved the work. It was fantastic. I traveled around the world. I worked with some really challenging people and I had great fun, but all these things come to an end. And I, you know, kind of woke up one day and felt I'd just done enough uh, and something was calling which I look back now and didn't understand at the time what it was but it was the start of peeling off the layers of the onion shall we say mm -hmm. um, uh, as, a, as a person shedding the skin of, a, the, of city life um, you know, of, of reconnecting myself to the rhythms of nature that were so natural to me as a child, that there's nothing like urban life and, uh, and the challenge of corporate business to separate you from, mm -hmm. from, from those rhythms. And, and I chose to fulfill a childhood dream of learning to ride, put a piece of land, but still carrying on consulting. Um, and determined with my marvelous mechanistic mindset of the time that within two years I would win badminton and there's nothing like horses right for teaching you to be a better human because you know I brought the the 
yeah, I'll call it the mechanistic mindset to the process. If I hired the best teachers, if I bought the best horses I could afford, you know, I would be Olympic champion in, in two, day, two years flat. Well, you know, I spent far more time in the dirt than I ever spent collecting red rosettes. And, you know, I, I credit horses as being some of my absolute best teachers. But what happened, two things, three things happen concurrently with that is when you when you are given a gift of land to manage, which is so incredibly important, no matter how small, how big, you start to reconnect to the patterns and the rhythms of what's happening around you. And there was no question that over the 15 years I was with that piece of land, my license to go in 15 year patterns, I, you become completely obsessed by weather because you're getting soaked to the skin riding horses every day. But you start to observe significant change happening in simple things like weather patterns. Weather patterns in the UK going from light sprinklings of summer rain most every other day to long periods <coughs> of drought and then torrential rain. And you, you, you start, have to start to think, you know, what is, what is happening here? And the river that bordered the property you know, slowly, slowly, it was flooding more often in the winter. Um, and two things really came together. Firstly, I was diagnosed with advanced lymphoma, mm. um, which was at stage four. Uh, the land I was living on was adjacent to a big pick your own fruit farm, and it was constantly spraying chemicals. And I was walking past and breathing in every day, and that's really not a good thing. Um, so suddenly you, you are faced with a mortal challenge and told that you know your chances of surviving this are pretty slim and so I made a decision to you know apply strategy again to the whole thing um, take myself out of work keep myself with the bugs that my body knew on the farm do the chemotherapy even though I didn't want to do the chemotherapy eat myself well and a mix of things worked but what happened as I came out of it was, you know, people make the assumption that if you survive cancer, you know, you're very carpe diem. Well, I was always carpe diem before I went in. Mm -hmm. And I came out of the other side mm -hmm. and depression set in. Wow. Uh, instead, I didn't realize it at the time. And then only a couple of years later, the floods in the winter started to get very, very much more dramatic. And one Christmas Eve, you know, by that time, I really only ha had about four horses left. I wasn't competing so much. They were dearly beloved horses that I'd had for, you know, 10, 12 years, uh, getting older. On the Christmas Eve, pitch dark, trying to get them in. The land had been flooded, trying to find pockets of, uh, 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 of grazing for them to be on during the day. And through the dark I could see a big wall of water coming at me and one minute it was on my ankles and the next minute it was up here and it stayed for eight weeks and it didn't go away and I lost the farm I lost the horses I had I felt I had to have I couldn't find a place to take them so I had to have them put down on one day and then somebody kindly tweeted what was happening to me and I made the national papers and news and before you could say knife um the animal rights activist groups uh, found me and started to attack me on social media, found my home, painted murder on the door. And when you're already on a path of depression, two, two major things have happened to you, bang, you hit rock bottom. And then when you hit rock bottom, there's only two choices you can make. You stick around or you, or you don't. Um, and so coming back to where we began, as I came out of that really the darkest place you it wouldn't want anyone to go I cannot even remember how it happened somebody may have recommended it uh, a book called Active Hope mm. and it was literally the first book I picked up as I came out of that really dark place and thank God for Joanna well but that's that's relatively recent we're still talking yeah. 16 17 or something Eight years, eight, about eight, eight, about, well, I, I lose count. Yeah, not that long ago, yeah. not that long ago. Mm -hmm. And it had literally just been published. And 
what it did, I think, for me is it is it showed me a path forwards from 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 where I had arrived at. I loved her framing of there being three different ways you can address the crisis of the world you can i don't think she called it this but i think of it as you can protect and preserve you can be involved in protecting uh the spaces the ecology and the life we've got left and supporting the people that have been hurt or you can play in the big field of systems change or you can work in the shifting consciousness which probably is the most important for and it, it gave me a framework and, and a sense that I could have, I didn't know what that role would be at that time. I was still stitching myself back together again, but it gave me a landscape to look at and to play in. Mm -hmm. And at the time uh, I had been doing some work in the EU on food systems. I had been hired by a group of NGOs to see what could be done through the medium of free trade agreements in Europe to, um, to, to embed more about sustainability, animal welfare, um, sustainable food systems in free trade agreements, which was incredibly difficult. So I, 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 had, a, I had a place to begin and, and I would say that was, is my third journey in life, if you like, that has taken the last six, seven, eight years through all of the fields that you would, would expect. I always had a deep interest in developmental psychology because it's part of telling brand stories. You need to understand how humans tick if you want to persuade them to buy more stuff they don't need, basically. But I was really interested in developmental psychology, living systems thinking, systems thinking, um, you know, you, I, I just started to delve, which is in fact how I discovered you and your work, because if anybody who's in the UK some, at some point in time on this journey will end up at Schumacher College or Fintel, and I was closer to Schumacher. Um, and I remember doing uh, my first trip there was to do a three week short course on economics in transition. Mm -hmm. And I remember listening to uh, Stephen Harding ask a question, which was, what would an economy look like that was consistent with living systems? And it's such a powerful question. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess that really gripped me, that question, not remotely being an economist, flunked every economics model of my MBA or anything else I ever could never grasp economics. But it gripped me as a question, and I guess I've been trying to answer that question ever since. What, what does it look like to transition an economy from the extractive economic model that I grew up with to something that puts life at, uh, at, it, at its heart? Um, and I guess I have got focused on economy because though I'm deeply interested in food systems, I'm deeply interested in education. I was very interested in fashion for many years. Um, you know, when you track world problems back, you come back where, whether you go through food systems, climate crisis, fossil fuels, yeah. you track Good back, thing, yeah. you're going to arrive at the belief in constant economic growth. Yeah, it's, it's weird, isn't it? It's actually true. It's the economy, stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, with humility, not being an economist, and you know, I, I, I guess it's been a, a process of trying to build up enough understanding of the interlocking challenges that we face to find the acupuncture points with the skills and the knowledge and who I am, where I could find a place to play, shall we say. And, and I guess going doing Regenesis's TRP was almost a culmination and the start of a new journey in that 
even though most of my life has been spent with global brands, and it's not that I say I'd never work for one again, the only conclusion that I felt I could come to was that whatever years I have left will be spent working with organizations, people, uh, companies, whatever you want to describe them, that have a really strong link to place. Mm. Um, just because, you know, it's the scale at which life designs. Um, it's the most visceral place, uh, you know, experience of the story of separation between humans and nature, people and people. You know, you, you can tell yourself all sorts of stories about the scarf that has arrived, man manufactured the other side of the world. But when you're having a difference of opinion with the person that you live next door to about what should be done in the world, it's right there in front mm -hmm. of you. And I think we become better humans by working through deep and difficult relationships in close in our close proximity. So well, I don't know if that was 10 minutes flat, and I'm sure I missed out yeah. a lot, but that's the best I can do. Well, fascinating, fascinating journey. Well, wow, thanks. And, and also like where you arrived, um, I mean, even the, the economy, it, it's, it's plural, basically. It's the same yeah. as with regenerative cultures, like the, the, yeah. the basic, but it's an interesting paradox, isn't it? That, that on the one hand, it only functions at a scale that is around place, local, regional, with deep connection to a sort of context that, that we can cognitively grasp. Yeah. Like the, the, this idea of not just the geographical terrain, but a terrain of consciousness, yeah. the, the, the bioregion. But but then this it's this both and, isn't it? There, there is a pattern of what you've studied when you worked with Janine on, on getting your biomimicry yeah. diploma. Um, the the pattern of or that 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 Fridjof describes in his work of how life functions. And and it's that pattern that will inform the diversity of different expressions of different economies and different cultures. So they they they're kind of similar, but they're unique. Yeah, yeah, and and, and I think the you know I'm a bit of a pattern geek. Um, I, I consider myself quite lucky that I find it easy to see patterns in things. Um, but, but it's not easy for everybody and pattern literacy is not something that has unfortunately arrived in the curriculum, uh, even though, you know, I really deeply think it, think it should. But, you know, just to take, go, to go back to Jersey, for example, as a little island, little island in the Channel Islands that most people know as a, think of as a, as a tax haven. When I was sort of, you know, looking at the island, and looking at the historical patterns of geology, uh, the, 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 the patterns of nature around the island, the cultural history, the economic history, when you look at the patterns around Jersey, so it has a phenomenal double dip tide, for example, that you see. So the tide in Jersey is, unbelievable the 40 50 feet come up and go down twi twice a day wow. so you see a really deep wave pattern flow of tide there is an incredibly strong tide that flows uh, uh, up and down the channel which mm -hmm. is unique doesn't happen in many places in the world nor does the the depth of the drop of the tide when you look at the actual geology of the island the incredible variety of different rock, the enormous diversity of rock on that little island is nothing like the other Channel Islands. It's nothing like the geology of the United Kingdom. There's only a couple of spots in, never each ready we, East Ireland and the north of Scotland that are even vaguely similar. I have never seen such a density of different type of uh, rock and geology on such a small island and when you start to look at those patterns 
and think about them in terms of the culture that has manifested in the island over years. It has had a culture of havening, not just in terms of being a tax haven, but as a, a, a you know a haven for uh, uh, during the Second World War, as a previous you know it has a really strong story of uh, how witches were treated in the Middle Ages. There, you know, you start to see to synthesize patterns. Um, you know, there's a the wave like pattern. There's an economic model it's called the Kondratiev model. Um, that you only see in geologies that have um, wave-like patterns. So if you think of Switzerland, Switzerland is formed by tectonic plates uh, coming together. Um, the kind of economies that you see that sprung up in the Middle East, you know, where you've got wind meeting sand, you get the same wave-like Kondratiev kind of uh, economic pattern, or almost you could look at those patterns and understand how with the prevailing mindset of the time, the mechanistic extractive dominant mindset of our age, Jersey could not have been anything other than a taxi. Nothing else in economically could have emerged with that type of geology, those sets of patterns over time in that particular place. Um, the interesting, really interesting question is what's the next evolution of that unique, of those unique patterns in the context of being at a time of existential threat to our species? And that for me, is what's incredibly fascinating about looking at economies through a living systems lens and bringing uh, a different way of sensing into what has happened over such a long time, those red threads that we talked about before, that essence. How do we take that story and apply it to the next evolution of an economy and a narrative and a story in place. And it's, it's fascinating that we, we actually, it's beautiful, we, 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 because you briefly told the story of the, the guy who was on before you telling yeah. the whole geological story. And so we've just come a beautiful little segue. Right um, and it's the, the way that you just framed this, is so at the heart of um, how you pick up energy that is not just in the place and in the people in their current culture, but goes deeper. Their current culture is as internationally brainwashed and influenced that might be by the media and all, all of that. It's still coming out of place. We can't but live in a place without the place informing us. And yeah, it, it, it calls, you know, I... I as I stood on the stage and said these words, I had this kind of like, God, I guess I think I'm as mad as a box of frogs. <laughs> um, the, a place calls people to it. We think we're, you know, we think we are making the cognitively smart decisions. Mm. But uh, uh, the rhythms and the energy flows of a place is what calls the culture and economy into being. It's not us. We're part of, part of that. Um, and you can only sense into, you can only feel that beat. I mean, it's still very new to me. You know, I'm slightly surprised every time I feel it because I think of myself as a smart analytical kind of person. So it catches me by surprise when I put my fingers in the soil of a place and I can feel that. Uh, that field, that field of energy that calls a culture and an economy into being. Um, but, you know, it, as you will know, it's, it's not easy to change your perspective and trust things that are very radically different to the things that you've been taught to trust and believe in. Um, so, you know, to try and persuade a nation, a small nation, island state nation's chief economist 
that they should listen to and, and sense into those patterns and respond to those patterns, you know, you're just going to get booted off the island. <laughs> you know, it's not, you, you, it, to, to be a successful, I think, systemic acupuncturist, you have to find the right irresistible invitation for people to be able to participate in the journey of, of transformation. I think people sense that we need something radically different from what's gone before, but it's incredibly difficult to imagine something you've never seen. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I agree. And I've also noticed that, that sometimes when you really let go of this sort of linear interference model and you just see memes, you see stories like, for example, you, you, you are mad as a box of frogs um, mm -hmm. talk will stay with some people yeah. and will become a story and it will be referred to. And, and before you know it, it, it actually becomes a place all around which narrative coalesces. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then you find the same narrative the next time you go there and somebody proudly tells it to you as if um, you kind of go, I recognize that sentence. Yeah. yeah? yeah but um, I mean, but you know, if, we, if we look at your um, work, the work, you know, when I first discovered your work, um, might have been 2015. Mm -hmm. Um, when I first came across your work, even then, the word regeneration, you know, you, you were pushing rocks uphill to get anybody to pay attention. Regeneration mm. here at that time would have been uh, uh, revitalizing brownfield sites in an urban context. Yes, yeah, or, or regrowing tissue. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, there's still quite a bit of that. Um, but you know, you, you could e e we could easily say, you know, the COVID pandemic opened a window, mm. but there were plenty of people of which you were, you know, cheapest, cheapest, is that a word? Um, you just made it up. Uh, uh, that had been seeding that, a new narrative, uh, Charles Eisenstein, yourself, so many people, um, and the field, creating that field of energy, sometimes takes many decades of work, unseen work, mm. um, uncelebrated un work sometimes, um, until that field of energy is ready to expand. Mm. Um, and I think the incredible interest over the last two years in regenerative design and culture um, is really hopeful. Yeah, but it's also, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, like I sometimes wonder, um, I've never, never gone for that walk or that had that deeper counsel with, with friends at Regenesis or so on, what, what they actually think, whether it's a good thing that the genie is out of the box and that so many people are now interested in what is this all about and is it different and what can we learn and, and, and so many people are selling it like the new kid on the block and the new trend. Um, yeah, I wonder whether, because I, I see that, for example, here on the island, like two, two reflections of what you were saying regarding my own experience here 12 years on, on Mallorca, is yes, deep insight to see how the place itself mm. is so central to shaping the culture, but it's also the place and it in all its contexts, its geographical location, like for here, for example, it's not just what the, the ecosystem, the bioregion, the island Mallorca gives you. It's the fact that whatever you have, how much or little it might be, you know, constantly somebody's going to arrive on your shores and, and like mm -hmm. take away your daughters or like for 2000 years, um, people who lived here were invaded. Um, from from the Romans, the Car Carthaginians, the, the Etruscans, the Phoenicians, you, you, you name it, and the, the English, the Germans. Um, and and then tourism came as a big, and like, it's it's a sort of, yeah, can, could Jer Jersey have been anything else but a tax haven? It, it, of course, it could have resisted the temptation. Mallorca could have resisted the temptation of tourism, but it's unlikely. Uh, um, yeah. and, and then how do you, how do you, 
go that next step of saying, okay, we're here because we're meant to be here, but how how do we move forward? And and I I noticed that like right now, regenerative is being picked up in so many conversations that that I couldn't even be part of even if I had had time oh, and yeah. intention. Uh -huh. Even here on the island. Um, and unfortunately, it's not really in the slightest um, shifting from the solutioneering mindset. It's just a new paint on so solutioneering. Um, and, and so it, it but it, it's okay. Like it, it opens a door, it's, it's a platform of conversation. There are some people who are doing it better than, than others. Yeah. Um, and and but, yeah, I think, I think in a way that's, that's almost always the way, you know, I, I always go back to Bill Sharp's amazing Three Horizons framework. Frameworks mm -hmm. work for me. They make life simple for me and I love his particular framework. And, you know, if we think about, you know, we're in the very early stages of birthing the third horizon in our lifetime. So the third horizon for us is the regenerative economy that we want. Um, which is not just the re regeneration of the, our planetary su life support systems, but the regeneration, the next development of the human spirit um, for me. But we're in the very early stages, I think, of birthing that third horizon in the unique context of having created existential threats for ourselves as a species, which, you know, is not a leap in human psychological development. We've not been at that, uh, at that point before. So I think we have a, you know, it is a unique set of circumstances in human history. But coming, you know, back to what you were talking about, about being called to place and finding yourself in a global economic system mm. is how, how do we, in, in every different way possible, make the, that next step, those next, those next leaps in, in context. Let me, let, let me just say, because you were there at a point where I felt this is really interesting and, and juicy, because I've, I've done quite a lot of work with, with Bill working with the Three Horizons with, with clients. And mm. um, one thing that I like particularly that Bill showed me at one point, but he doesn't actually do, use it that often, is if you take, if you imagine the Three Horizon map was on there. Yeah. <clears throat> you can actually just fold it over like this yeah. and do this. And yeah. what, what it does is that when you rise up that green line, and you stand on top of that green mountain of the third horizon, you look down and it's red. Yeah. It's it's the next iteration of the circle. You, you, the, the new status quo becomes the, the the new, like it's it's the panarchy cycle. It's yeah. Yeah. it becomes to it, it gets ingrained, it becomes static, um, it becomes the old no, the, the, the old normal. Um and, and it becomes the system that has become such a functional living system that it has autopoiesis and wants yeah. to keep itself alive like so many out large corporations that have done their bit in in, in the last century and are still sticking around because yeah. um, because because we're, we're here we're alive we need to continue yeah. uh? they're a living system and all living systems fight to stay alive it's it that's co com completely normal but um, I find I find that really like that in combination with this other insight, like you mentioned Joanna Macy being really influential on, on in your sort of third um my third things. life. Yeah. Um it, I same here, like she's she's been a huge influence on my life. And um just before I had this blip in this conversation series, one of the last conversations I had were was um with, with Berger, with um Chris Johnston, um, yeah. is her co-author of Active Hope. Yeah. And what I found really fascinating is that in that conversation that emerged, that something had happened in their conversation that has also happened in me. The, okay. the, the, the question of, is the framing of the great transition the appropriate framing anymore? 
Like it seemed like such a good, like we're midwives of the new and we're, mm. we're, we're a hospice workers of the old. We're moving mm. from the um, industrial growth society to the life sustaining society. It, it's a beautiful framing and it, it speaks yeah. to what, what needs to happen. But, but it is perpetuating a, a pattern of thought that I think is a, a from this to that, which tends mm. to be a dismiss yes. the old to build the yeah. new. It's an overswinging the pendulum. It's not synthesis, it's thesis and thesis. Yes. That's, that's one thing that is the danger of it. But the other thing is it, I think that the complexity and the existential threat that we've created mm -hmm. is now so fast yeah. that it's an illusion that we ever even, it's not a bridge to cross. No. It's getting used to stay on the bridge. Yeah. Because it's it's sort of yeah. It, it's, 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 you're on a bridge in a very high wind, right? Like it's, it's your three keynotes. Um, change, what was it? Challenge, change, and um, uh, and adding well, adding value. Adding value. Would be yeah. Boring, but exactly. And stretching the well. Challenge and change is a constant. Yeah. And and the only thing we can can aim to do is add value. Um, yeah. it, it, it's as as simple as that. That's why I said like this is fascinating because I feel like. It, it speak like um, this. This whole notion of let's just invest, and then we do the transition, and then we build the perfect system. And it, it's it's the solutioneering again. It's yeah. to think that if Mallorca just had all syntropic agriculture, all public, community-owned, corporately-owned um, food, water, and energy and transport systems. Um, a little bit of international regenerative tourism run on synthetic kerosene um, and, and you name it, yeah? then, then everything would be hunky-dory and we'd live ha happily ever after. And, and it's just, can we, can we stop telling such a simplistic story? <laughs> Well, I, I, you know, this, so, so this is, so, you know, we're, we're about to get into super, we, well, we are in super interesting territory because um, most common question I get asked is, yeah, but Jenny, can you make this a bit more simple? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Elevation I had a fascinating math teacher when I was at school called Mrs. Pack. And Mrs. Pack was incredibly fast with her chalk and her blackboard <laughs> uh, with a, a, a geometry. And I was good at math, so that was okay for me. I really enjoyed the speed that she went at, but most of the class really couldn't, couldn't bear it. And they would be screaming out, could she go slower? Could she slow down? And she would always say to them, well, how about um, I'll go a little bit slower if you go a little bit faster? And my answer is always when I get asked the question, could you make this a bit more simple is, could you make a bit more effort to learn to dance with complexity? Nice one. Good. And, Good reply. And, and but that is not easy because we have been deeply conditioned to short, stark, sharp, staccato, sound bite, quick, simple answers to everything. It's, and it's, it's, even when the will is there mm -hmm. to dance with complexity, we don't have the, the tools necessarily or the environment in which it is encouraged to do the deep work of dancing with complexity. Also, also because I mean we've and we've been there just earlier. Um, it's the economy, stupid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that, that ultimately, I mean, I've had this this morning. Two lovely people, both invested in helping to shift the agricultural patterns on the island towards mm -hmm. the positive. Let's put it yeah. that way. Um, both still a lot of margin to learn and go deeper, but one of them betting on almonds and the other one betting on algal robbers. And I'm saying the bet is stopping to have a field of almonds and a field of algal robbers. Um, but the analysis is just like, no, 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 it's so much more economical. And the guy even tells me proudly that he's thinking about investing nearly 300,000 into a machine that is four meters high by five meters that drives over the yeah. rows of his almond trees and harvests his almond trees in five days, where normally he would pay, have to pay three people six weeks to do that job and possibly lose a lot of the almonds in the process because the weather might change. Uh -huh. and, 
and because he's a trained economist, it actually makes sense. It, it makes sense, the investment, because, oh yeah, it'll last 20 years and over 20 years, and if I would have to pay the people and insure them and all of that, that would cost, oh God. And, and, and he's, a, he's a good man, he's not a bad yeah. man. Um, and, and you kind of go, okay, this is what, what we have to deal with, is, yeah. is um, people being so, f- afraid to zoom out, even the government isn't making one and one, adding one and one together. The, the, the fact that saving those three people's salaries for a few months is ultimately picked up by the collective in paying their unemployment benefits. Uh-huh. And, and the whole rat's tail of inequality in health, of ill health in that family, bad education, bad chances in the future, it's, it, it's all interconnected. And, and yeah. we don't make, like the, the bills support the give it to me more simply, so I can put it on an Excel sheet and calculate yeah. whether it, the numbers fit. And the reality is that when you mix it all together, but it's almost like you have to trust because you can't like, I, I still think that the people who le- believe that if we just have the better algorithms and more available data, we will be able to program it all. A, I think that if we did that, we would lose our freedom yeah. because we'd ultimately create a machine that would, according to our storytelling, be better at making our decisions than we are. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> Excuse me. I mean, people are already doing that in Silicon Valley. Yeah. People, again, good people yeah. that, that care and yeah. actually have lived their story for so long enough that exponential tech is unavoidable that they now think the only thing I can do is influence it positively. And yeah. so they they build yeah. the owl of the future. And there will be a benevolent owl who will say, yeah. Game over. He, he, yeah, here's, here's how we solve this. I mean, deeply, deeply, are you familiar with Daniel Schmachtenberger? Yeah, I was okay. actually thinking so, of him right So now. deeply, deeply at the, the, the coming back to complexity, but also as part of complexity is, is finding ways in which you can make sense of such phenomenal complexity because that has got, grown beyond the capacity of any single human mind, right, to even begin to understand. Mm-hmm. So first, um, you know, the the huge cultural shift towards collective intelligence is happening everywhere I look at grassroots level. But political systems and economic systems still haven't grasped that nettle. Um, So that's that's one thing. But um, Finding ways in which, as an individual or an organization, you can make sense of complexity, uh, the complexity around you, always brings me back to place. Yeah, because exactly. Because the scale this that is, we this is, this is... understand and see mm-hmm. how to work with complexity, the one the piece of complexity that you can take out of the jigsaw puzzle is going f- from global to, I think okay. your word, global. That's mm-hmm. not, that doesn't mean that g- the complexity of global systems goes away, but if you can start to work with it from a point, uh, uh, from a perspective of place, a geography of place, you stand a smaller, stronger chance of being able to uh, dance with the idea of, n- knowing that whatever you do, there's no guarantee that it's the right thing to do, but you can manage the experimentality of it in a, in an easier container. So if it's, you it's, take food. It's, I'm, I'm so excited about this because I completely agree with you. And it, it's not a lot of people see this. Like a lot of people think that this recent resurgence of bioregional thought is just some sort of socio-political fad that plays into the sales of this, that, and the other political color or whatever. And they just don't get that, A, we were talking in this conversation earlier about living principles, that in terms of healthy nested scaling in nature, we have not paid attention to the region for too long. And that's really created a brittle fucked up system that is dying. 
Uh, because we've taken the energy out of a nested system. It's yeah. sort of like one of the Russian dolls is missing. Yeah. And and the other bit, and everybody is kind of going, ah, all this data and, and what, how are we going to deal with it? And, and yeah, it's because we're looking at the abstract. We're looking at the globalizing abstract pattern that, and then we're trying wherever we look at the specific, we immediately just use it to inform more yeah thinking and conversation about the abstract how do we save the planet yeah and in the minute you switch that lens around and you look at the bioregion yeah. a all that theory let's unite the willing in all the bioregions of the world and create bioregional centers and then we will transform the world kind of goes away a little bit when you actually engage to the scale of the reason because you can suddenly go, well, us here on a piece of land growing a few trees like I do on the piece of land I am is really not going to transform the system. Sorry, like, don't want to pop my own balloon here. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and, and, and so it's when you, when you suddenly look at the diversity of, pin, of, of opinions, the mess, uh, like, for example, you and I, we've both started to work with the odd enlightened public authority that is trying to do regional work. Yeah. They're completely between the rock and the hard place. Um, We're constantly getting the most ludicrous messages from our pie, particularly in your country at the moment. Yeah. With that I mean, yeah, at it's the, really at the bad here. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, mean we, I won't name names. We're actually talking, we have talked to the same person in England who, who has to suffer the messages from this man still. Yeah. Um, uh, may it not last that much longer. Um, <laughs> but, but um, yeah, it's, but it's the same here. It's like right now there's a government in the Balearic Islands who is talking about energy, water, and food sovereignty. Okay. Yes, there may might be a little bit, some of them, of the, the ilk, which is also the danger of bioregionalism. So another shadow I would love to talk to you about. Yeah, um, I'm just, about, is, I'm is, just is, is writing that kind of, down here. Shadow yeah. parochialism. <laughs> exactly. Of, of the kind of right wing, um, yeah. let's build the lifeboat, us against them, and yeah. the world is going but to bits. That's, that, yeah. that's one of the challenges of uh, relocalization in a global context is for most of us, most of us in our recent history, have seen very recent history with Brexit and Trump have seen the rise of populism and, and, and parochialism. And one of the challenges for the bioregionalism movement that first arose over in the US, I think, um, was the argument that culturally it pulls people back into populism and mm -hmm. parochialism. So the challenge, I think, for us when we are trying to re-regionalize resiliency and economies is not to think about it as contracting in, mm -hmm. shrinking down, national, uh, uh, falling into a form of nationalism, because we all fear that. We've all seen that in different forms in our lifetimes, very radically. Um, so that is, if I think of J.G. Bennett's Law of Three, uh, that's the resisting energy to, uh, to the impulse to uh, be interested in the potential of bioregional economies and re-regionalizing. So I, I, because food is something I, I'm more familiar with than many other systems, if I think about creating greater local resiliency and health, health in food systems and human health, people, people with, uh, who want to make it simple, make it simple in their minds by saying things like, yeah, but we can't grow all the wheat that we need in Sussex. Mm. We can't grow all the corn, that in fact, we can't grow any corn in Sussex. We don't grow very well here. But it's not about thinking that way. It's about trying to design an economy that where it possibly can grows what it can for itself 
and works within a global context for what it can't. Now that sounds well, very simplistic. No, but the, but this is this is. I mean, I've had this this conversation not just with one, but actually with a number of surprisingly large multinationals. Yeah. Um, Danone and, is doing this well. And it's not necessarily like I mean, I only work with those kind of too big not to fail in the current format companies. Yeah. Um, with a kind of integrity promise to myself that I will not mince my words. Um, if yeah. they if if they don't, call me, don't if they don't call me back, then 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 I'll um, I just get a good day rate for a few days and, and then they don't call me back. That's okay. Um, but but uh, in these conversations, I'm always struck. I mean, it's it's usually with with some other consultancy firm inviting me into them because I'm I'm too small to to be contracted by these large companies. But um, in these conversations. I'm always surprised how open they actually are to the notion of letting go. Like this, this notion of focus on the human potential of the people that you have, focus on what you're good at. And, and in one context, um, Dana Baumeister did a, did, did a wonderful um, biomimicry exercise, you know, the genotype phenotype exercise where yeah. you invite people to to say, okay, never mind what your company looks like right now. Look at what you do well, and what can you build out of those Lego blocks? Like it could be something completely else. And and um, in that context, companies very quickly realize that wait a minute. Yes, we're global. We have a global network, but we have very strong regional yeah. homes. And what would happen if we structured around those regional? as different enterprises in those regions and thin out that global as the enabling bit yeah. of that network of yeah. regional companies. Yeah. And, and, and this kind of decentralized, not just decentralized manufacturing, but actually decentralizing ownership and de decentralized, yeah. like becoming specific to place, like the, the, the holy grail of how, like even as these companies wake up, how do we have less impact? Well don't ship stuff all around the globe yeah. if you don't if you don't have to because this is again the the, the, the thesis and thesis is overswinging the pendulum danger and I I wish we could have that nuanced conversation around a like we're talking about 150 years of time to completely and utterly phase out of anything mined out of the earth's surface maybe less, maybe 70, uh -huh. but, but which elements and what do we still need to mine? And if we have limited amounts of energy for now, what do we need to put our energy into? And how do you grow regional economies that are enabled by the remaining global trade? So it's yeah. not, they, they, they don't become a competition to global trade, they actually become the driver of a healthier global trade that is maybe, I would hope, 80, like 20% of the current volume, but maybe it's 40% of the current volume. And of course, that means that a lot of business models go out of the window, but these are the deeply destructive business models that are kill, yeah. killing the planet they and that we're all paying for. Uh, they're not business models, they're destruction models that, that have been painted over as business models. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's it's... I think there are a lot of global, you know, we tend to, you know, I think you can tend to look at global businesses as the enemy and they're full of good people. Um, you know, and in my very younger years when I, I was doing and decided to do an MBA in the late 80s, one of the companies that we studied a great deal was Procter & Gamble, mm. who even then was extremely good at decentralizing innovation. Mm. Um, so it, it would pick a regional hub uh, in the US and put that entire business into innovating a particular product sector. And what it learned there, it would then adapt in other places around the world. That was as early as the 1980s. It's changed a lot since then. But it was a very, very interesting model to look at and learn from. Danone right now, um, in terms of its regenerative agriculture rollout, mm. is working very differently with its model 
uh, in North Africa than it is in never eat trade a week. Uh, Eastern United, the Eastern United States seaboard, mm. and has understood that both ecologically, economically, culturally, it needs a different model to collect and distribute dairy products in Morocco than it does in 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 Maine. So, mm. not all global uh, businesses are looking that way, but they are starting to understand and work with a more decentralized model, uh, distributed ownership. Um, you know, it's not perfect mm. yet. You know, the, it, you can't, it will never be perfect and you can't get away from the fact that we still are vastly over consuming on a global scale of just about everything that we touch. Well, I mean, this is, this is where I fear that like, I mean, it seems like you've been in a number of these food systems conversations and, and like I noticed that 2020, 21 was a sort of time when suddenly um, UNDP, uh, UNEP, UNITA, uh, you name it, plus, plus a number of NGOs, plus a number of global think tanks, were all working on food systems, food systems, food systems. And, um, and it immediately brings up, of course, most of these people know this too and work systemically enough to, to look at the water system and the energy system and the soil system. But the danger is nevertheless still that we, we tend to, again, simplify um, complexity away by abstracting a food system or even if like we look at a case study, but we look at it in order to abstract principles and, and generalities. And um, standardization it, is and the it's end. So, and it's so much about like your food system, your water system, your energy system. And particularly also you, if we want to shift towards increased biomaterial cultures, less mind material, um, increased regional innovation, new products, new materials, new ways of making stuff out of local available material, then we need to find ways of incentivizing that. And, and it, it, it only makes economic sense. It makes economic sense, but you need to take the big complex data sheet and look at your health system and your unemployment system and what it actually costs your tech system to run a, a crooked economy that is leaning 80% towards tourism, like, like here in Mallorca, for example, eh? um, that, that, that we have the highest rate of school leavers in, in the whole of Spain because kids can make more money being waiters and, 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 and bartenders in hotels than, than if they go to school. Uh -huh. um, and then they never progress beyond a certain, like it, it, it's tempting when you're 16 to get that money, but when you're 45, you can hardly yeah. run your family on it. Uh -huh. yeah. I mean, I, I, I was very lucky in, to live in Stockholm for five years, right? The mm. beginning of my career. and. Um, hope hope that I picked up something of Scandinavian developmental approach to life and I you know I I think the story captured beautifully in Thomas Bjerkman's book The Nordic Secret mm of how the Nordic countries at the start of the 20th century systemically set out to change from a poor agrarian economy to the economies they currently have, not that they are perfect and without global footprint, uh, although none of us are, um, is a very interesting one because it really was a very long-term plan and strategy that starts and ends with education, which is why I maintain an interest in education and coming back to um, Je full circle to Joanna Macy's work and the shift in consciousness being the most important work you can possibly do is, is to, to be able to change all of those systems, you have to change the way you think. Mm -hmm. This um, is really, interesting. You know, is I, I come back full, full circle. No, it's a great segue also because we, like we should watch time and I wanted to, to come to your 
learning journey and oh sorry you know, so, <laughs> yes, so, yes so, i wasn't looking at the clock so, um, so but but it's it's nice to to like because i i mean you know that i've been like most of my the bulk of my working hours of the last 20 years have been as an educator but mm -hmm. i could say if i look at it over 20 years time i'm i'm sure that it tells some, something about education i could probably say that 70% of my income has been made in 20% of my time mm -hmm. and not with education. Um, yeah. but, but all the other time was filled um, yeah. working for not a lot of money in education. I mean, I wrote the guys, large parts of the guy education curriculum. Yeah, I know, which is amazing. And, 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 it, and it, it, but it still feels like you, that's just one calculation because in those moments of um, the moments that that you you told your story like we we all at some point faced these moments of has this been it and and yeah. um, i need to take stock i need to kind of say what's been worth it and mm -hmm. and it's interesting for me that that as much as i sometimes feel a certain resentment and a little bit of a hurt of having put so much love sweat and tears into education for for being left with a certain insecurity financially uh, mm -hmm. out of that time yeah but um the the meaning that came from actually having focused on meaning rather than money having focused on this transfer like i remember when 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 brian goodwin who was one of the educators who really touched me in the masters in holistic science that, that really changed my life at, at Schumacher college in 2001 he came to see me just after I finished my PhD, which was this massive 750 page initial attempt to talk about all this stuff. This like it was, it was the subtitle was called a holistic and integral approach to complexity and sustainability. So it was dancing around what we're talking about. And and he he said to me, so why did you bother writing all this? And then he, and this was in 2006. He said, you need to put it all for free on the internet. And I was a bit too much of an academic in 2006, mm -hmm. thinking like, I, like that this is all my work and I need to first publish it and I need to get papers. And 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 he's, he was absolutely right. It took me years to, to realize it. And it was only that when I gave it away that, that it, it in, un, unfolded as something that was actually like, I only started publishing my PhD stuff after I ran out giving my book away and I needed more material to post on, yeah. on Medium. And suddenly I was posting 15 year old stuff and, and people were going, this is really interesting, give me more. Uh -huh. um, but I'm, I'm just sharing it because, because there's such a hunger for this information and, and people have like, I've been busy just churning it out for free, but, but there, there, there's been these wonderful learning journeys that that mm -hmm. people have set up to give a bit more structure and to help people with webinars and and coach them and, and and give them more focus rather than like i just give random material and find what you want and and make use of it yeah. but but i would love to to hear both your experience of, of because you you really like you and, and laura together um during the pandemic did a great service to a lot of people by running these learning journeys like you you, you hit a spot where people were just saying this is exactly what I need right now that somebody helps me journey through this material. Uh, and, and, and it was purely, it was purely by chance. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I had a, yeah, one of my many hats foray into academia and I was a course director, um, uh, wrote a, a master's and a degree course in London. Didn't stick with it because I just couldn't cope with the academic, so I'm, you know, I'm the least academic person you'll ever meet, but I loved my students to pieces. Mm. And I've always loved learning, you know, I would happily spend the rest of my days with my nose in a book and learning, you know, I'm hungry myself for new knowledge all the time, I can't ever get enough, I'm always, you know, over the next horizon. But when I set up Really Regenerative, I mean, what a time to set up a new CIC in mm. February 2020. <laughs> you know, like bad timing, bad, bad timing. Um, learning journeys were always in its future, but I wanted to set it up as a, a, a what I'd call a backbone organization. And its first couple of years were really going to be about 
a long term study with 30 to 40 small towns and villages um, to, to really understand how you could connect community field of energy with transformation from, from place, whether it was using Kate's donut economics model or other models. And of course, all grand plans, you know, fall flat on their nose very quickly. And that just wasn't going to happen in the pandemic when all everything that was designed for its first year was in place in person and funded to be in place in person. And then funding went, we're going over here to COVID. So. Just very briefly, so you don't feel so bad. Like I, I had planned for 2020 with Nora Bateson and with Kate and with Anna Pollock, we've already been in conversations of running something and, and with Stuart Cohen from the Capital Institute of running something right. here on Mallorca that was sort of trying to get the conversation around the donut warm data and yeah. um, what would a regenerative tourism for Mallorca look like, kind of juicing it up by inviting a few people and, and, and getting it funded and all that. But of course, no way. Yeah. So, that, so that all kind of fell flat on its nose very quickly within a month. Mm -hmm. And like lots of people, I think they you know, oh, OK, uh, OK, normal consultancy work <laughs> disappeared. So suddenly there was time on my hands to think about, OK, so maybe it's time to actually just think about what the learning journey part of this would look like. And um, and so they happened more by accident and gift of COVID than, than anything else. And um, because people, you know, because it was a real pause, you know, I think of my, my, my first bout with cancer is that I had my COVID moment, you know, 10 years before COVID arrived to, to, to stop and think and have a chance to explore, get off the treadmill of business as usual and explore something new. And it, you know, the hunger was there. It just tapped into a hunger. And there are many amazing sort of learning journeys popping up all over the place now mm. out there. Um, you know, and my own have shifted more into place focus than, you know, I, I'm not, I, you wouldn't call me a leadership expert by any means. Um, but, but I think there is... At that time, there was just a deep hunger to be in community mm. and have a space to explore anything, mm. and, you know, what, 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 whatever it was in that pause that really resonated with people. But I think one of the things that was interesting about watching the energy field of in, in my place and just in the whole world as we traveled the curve of the pandemic is in that early 2020 spring, it was very still and highly charged emotionally. And in, mm. you know, if you talk Kubler Ross curve in shock. Yeah. By the autumn, there was a little bit of a different sense of energy there. Mm -hmm. And by spring 2021, my sense was that the really reflective learning journeys of 2020 will continue to be really important for anybody who needs that space. But I really deeply felt that what I needed to then go on to offer was a deep reflective space combined with the practicality of how can I experiment with this new perspective? so that um, I'm not just coming to learn, I'm coming to explore, go out, experiment, iterate, experiment, iterate, experiment, iterate. So that you could give people tools, ideas, sense-making capacity, that they could go out and do something safely without rocking the boat in whatever their sphere was tremendously, whether that was in terms of how you shaped a narrative, whether it was how you invited a stakeholder community in to a project in a different way. And I think Power of Place, I hope, um, achieved that, even though I, I, 
as is my one, I inveterately overstuffed it with, <laughs> with work mm -hmm. and knowledge and um, conversations and things to do. How, how many people are enrolled on it now? We, at the very first one were, we had, I think about 55 people in the very first one. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people we'll have in the next one that's coming up. It's only opening for enrollment. Um, the, uh, in the fall last year, um, I decided to, I had a lot of individual people, but I really wanted to invite teams in. And so we did run a, an experiment with teams that a funder kindly came up and, and offered funding for. And that actually, I think, proved very successful. So that you could actually bring a group of people from an organization in. And whilst they were learning, uh, they could either retrospectively or live apply the thinking and the discussions and the ideas to a project that they were working on at the time. So, so the you, RSA were in that category, for example. So you actually had an external funder funding you to take other organizations through a learning journey that they yeah. didn't have to pay for. Uh, it was a, yeah, it was a that was a sort of pilot experiment. It was very last minute. So uh, in addition to the people that had already signed up and some of those were teams, I went to a group of people in different places around the world that I knew um, who I thought might benefit from that. I think there were in the pilot, there were six teams um, at, at and I uh, then went to made a report uh, just recently to the funder and hopefully they are going to fund m more this year. They're considering what they might do now. But those, you know, there, so there was, for example, a team from Jersey that came and looked at uh, how they might change political engagement on the island through the lens of living systems in place. So that was their project. I had a team from the Lake District come who were looking at how they could revitalize landscape through a different and um, innovative approach to the wool industry out of uh, the Lake District. Um, we had teams from Peru, um, as far afield as Peru, who were looking at uh, dry forest regeneration and um, uh, coastal uh, um, coastal ecosystem regeneration. We had a lot of, you know, different teams. We had a team from Turkey that were looking at um, a, a, an estuarine uh, project with Jody's project, mm -hmm. and another team that was looking at urban roof gardens in Izmir. Mm -hmm. uh, it, yeah, it was a really, really wide, very different varied group of people some we had a, a, a big uh, estate in Scotland that is uh, going through an experiment of a democratic experiment of finding ways to hand the estate back to the local people nice um, robots in Scotland but yeah it was really really fascinating which, which uh, part of Scotland because I uh, Fife in Fife oh, Falkland. Falkland. Oh, Falkland. Falkland. Oh, lovely Falkland yeah they, they do a lot of interesting stuff uh, we so had it, uh, City council teams come looking at urban regeneration projects. It was. But this, describe a little bit the format. Like, so, so people, all these teams went through, is it eight weeks? 12 weeks. 12 weeks. Well, well it's four, it was actually 14 weeks. And it's, it was really too tight and too condensed. So I'm going to stretch it out a little bit longer this year and have a community of practice afterwards, which I just simply, you know, you, you spin plates, you don't have time to do everything. And I planned to have the community of practice ready at the end of mm. 2021 and I didn't, mm. um, and that was a shame. But um, so we really start with what I describe as the ground you need to stand on if you really actually want to try and work regeneratively so we start with a look at the story of separation so how we got here um root causes of current crisis which you know most people in the regenerative world will be very familiar with we do quite a lot of work in the early stages on understanding developmental psychology developmental process 
so, so you, that you can are have. Are you a, building on on kind of Wilbur Combs letters type stuff, or, or yeah, more developmental? Um, or what, I, what, what I would say I, I I blend quite a lot of different schools. Mm -hmm. Um, I love Carol Sanford's very easy way of describing uh, different levels of consciousness. I think she really nailed that that thinking for, from uh, uh, that she would describe through mechanistic, humanistic, um, regenerative. I think the do more good, the arrest disorder mm. her, the way she describes that works for me but I will work with whatever works with the people that come people come from Lalu background and they understand spiral dynamics and color coding it's all mm. it's just different ways of describing yeah. the same thing to me um you know I'm as you will know I'm a very much a generalist we do uh, quite a bit of pattern literacy Mm -hmm. which it, it, it is really important to me because I think if you're trying to work out how you can craft a pathway which is the, the next leap, pattern literacy is in place is really important. It's unless you have some understanding of the core patterns that show up in, uh, it, it, in nature, it's very hard to stretch your mind to think about how you can apply that in economic or design or um, the design of a development. So um, with, with the help of uh, the brilliant Jeff Lawton and permaculture, um, pattern thinking and pattern mind is something that we do quite a lot of right up front. Um, and then we will step into the relational, uh, regenerative relationship building part of the work, which is, you know, how do you engage um, stakeholders in a project in a regenerative way, in a way that is just and equitable and fair. We look at uh, elements of deep democracy. We look at uh, when, uh, the so design of things like... Saying, um, hold on, when you say deep democracy, you mean Anna Mendel's process-oriented psychology type type work, yeah. like the world work? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, um, right. We look at, um, sorry, I've lost my, uh, where, where was I now? I'm just, I'm going, I'm de designing myself through the path. Um, we look at how you might design the structure around regenerative placemaking. So, how to think about ownership, different ownership models um, that you could uh, weave into your projects. We look at narrative arc. We look at the, then we look at role, um, role and purpose of how your place sourced or place based project will play a role in the evolution of the nested system so that it sits within. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the end of the 12 week course, we have traveled through probably 12 different modules where the teams will then write up a, a less of a plan, but more of an end state journey vision for mm -hmm. where they're going to take the particular project and, that they're going to work on. And so each team just to tell, like just to give it one more under, deeper understanding of the format. Um, as people journey through this, what's the is it week by week? And so what's week. the weekly format? There, there's one face-to-face yeah. -face call, there's a PDF yeah. that the people get sent out. So, How do you run so it? So there's there's pre-reading and watching. Mm -hmm. hopefully more video than reading, though there is stuff to read, so that the, the, the learning part of the material is presented in formats that different, different people learn in different ways. Some people like long form, some people like short videos, some people will like and you, longer. And videos. you leave people, you give people an option and they can navigate yeah. through it. That's, up, that's yeah, how I would up, do it. Up to yeah. them. Yeah. So there is information that prepares for the live session. The live sessions are all designed so, so designed in such a way, particularly in the early stage, to build psychological safety and relationship amongst people, even the teams that come as a team. So in the early part of the two, each two hour live session, uh, there we will work on 
the material that has been presented through discussion formats, I wouldn't describe it as Socratic or Bohmian dialogue, but close. Um, and people will work together in twos and threes in small groups. And then later on in the two hour session, they'll go out in their cohort group to apply the knowledge to their pro product project. And that was every week for 14 weeks. That was too intense um, because there's an awful lot of uh, information. So we're going to stretch it out this year over a longer period of time with some breaks without live sessions to give people a chance to catch up because there is a lot of material, there are a lot of exercises, there are a lot of opportunities to go out and test ideas in simple, small ways if you're working on a live project. But did did uh, you, as, as you were holding this these different groups going through this journey, did you only engage with the cohort as a whole or did you also... Um, add another layer of your own work in, in all of this, of, of, of meeting with each individual kind of team? I, I did it this time round, um, simply because we wanted to try and offer it at a very accessible cost. Yeah, and, um, and you know, it's always the balance, the time people have available, the budget people have available, and the time that you want to give it, you know, I always will give far more time than is, you know, if I was looking at an economic model, as, you, as with you with with education, than than it, it you know, it makes economic sense. But certainly, I think that that is an element that will come into 2022 so that we'll stretch out the time over a longer period to give people more time to absorb and apply and experiment with the learning and uh, also offer them more time, not just with me, because it's not all, certainly not, I can't hold the space for everything, but with the guest speakers that will come or more will come on board. So. Um, hopefully you'll be able to join us uh, this year. And those guests have speaking... Have we not fixed it? I thought we fixed we it. We haven't fixed it. I sent you a date, but I don't... Don't, don't play this game again with me of cancelling. <laughs> like, because the last time you cancelled because you said you're not going to run it, and then you did run it. And anyway... No, no, we are, we're off. Let's go, we're let's off. Go. Uh, um, so, you know, those were very valuable sessions for the cohort, but I think, you know, they were... People are hungry to spend time with people such as yourself, but you've only got so much time to, you know, you spread yourself incredibly thin as it is. Um, but I think that almost all of the teams would have wanted to have extra one-to-one -one sessions with mm -hmm. Uh, the guest speakers and with me so if we can make it economically viable for people we'll we will build that in this year because it's it sounds, important. sounds wonderful and i mean I'm, I'm curious to see how they because it's like i've had some people say like why well, haven't you put out a uh, learning journey yet have you not noticed that there's this one this one and this one and i just celebrate it i think it's wonderful that they're all out there because you've i mean just it's John. John Fullerton's just launched yeah. an amazing program. But but the, I mean, staying with you is like the story you just told and your journey has such a wealth of experience to share in a way that only you can share it. And and it will use your language and what made sense to you, and that will make sense to some people more than and others. others yeah. and, and and it's the same for me. It's the same for Laura. It's the same for Giles. It's the same for John. Um. And the wonderful thing is that we are offering more and more entry points. It's the same yeah. for, for all the wonderful people in who in, in Portugal are like on fire, like the, the, the yeah. TRP is getting bigger and bigger every year. Yeah. Um, and and I'm I'm celebrating it. And it's it's just wonderful that that we're engaging and and that more and more doors are open yeah. to find an entry point in the conversation. And then people yeah. can can navigate in the way that that makes sense to them. And that's, yeah. that's how it and, and I think, you know, there are many roads to Rome. Everybody has a, a, a different expression of, of what this is. And the thing that I think is really, I'm really mindful of is when I started this learning journey myself, it was a very lonely journey. 
Mm. You know, when, when you first start to really intentionally change your own thinking and perspective, you know, it, th there are some pretty horrible things that arrive. But, that but, but, isn't it, but isn't it fascinating that even, because like even the John's, John Fullerton's story is, is also one of this, like being at the top of the, the game that most people aspire to right now, like yeah. them, yeah, who, like like all these people running after money, like imagining to to shave yourself and now I'm off to Wall Street to make a few millions, mm. um, is is probably like up there with yeah. this yeah, guy's laughing. Like He's a managing yeah. director of Goldman Sachs. What more can you achieve in life in that world? But but the way he he tells the story of, of eventually realizing as he was shaving that he was looking at the man who had understood that this entire thing was running against the wall and yeah. nobody was doing anything yeah. about it yeah. and and this kind of growing sense of like I can't look at myself in the mirror anymore if I don't and 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 he himself like had to let in 2002 which is really the saving grace if he had done it in 2008 I wouldn't call it a saving grace um <laughs> to to say no more Goldman Sachs I'm doing something yeah. else uh -huh. but um but he's been on that journey and it, it always, and I've been on that journey of, of being disappointed by marine science being too quantity and statistics focused and not, not the naturalist science and, and kind of at some point realizing that I could study whales and dolphins all my life, but they would probably go extinct and what's the point of that? Uh -huh. And um, so we all found that place where we then had to undo the specialist learning that, that we've been sort of submitted to, although the work market was asking of us as well. Uh, and, and even to forge in this kind of hunger that you were describing of wanting to learn so many different things, like stringing a harp that can can only sound unique and then and then learning to play it, because initially it's, it can be quite a discord trying to play all the strings together. Yeah. Um, and but this is really what this is all about. I think this is the, and, and I think it's Laura's journey too, like Laura with, with, with being such a go-getter and achiever in the kind of moving the climate change conversation. And then, then having this accident and, and this story of just stop, slow down. Uh -huh. yeah. And then having to rebuild her, herself out, out of that. Uh -huh. I, I think some, I think when you have that energy, you know, I certainly had that energy. It takes a couple of smacks around the head before you pay attention. Mm. And it certainly took two big ones for me before I really, really um, bought into, shall we say, that my role here was not what I thought it was. Um, okay, again, but, this is maybe this is because it is well almost two, hour, uh, two hours now um recording um so so um but this is an interesting loop again to, to finish the conversation with because it maybe humanity needs those two smacks around the head to realize that our role is a different one here um yeah so, you know and I, it, 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 if you had said to me the role of humans on earth is to be as stewards of life and uh uh systemic catalysts for evolution even 10 years ago i would just been give me a break you know <laughs> what are you talking about um and if I, I i'm not sure i've even thought of the possibility of humans having a role beyond you know, beyond what's laid out for you when you drop out of the room, you know, you go to school, you'll get a job, you'll climb the corporate ladder in the career pole, you'll retire, you'll go this on is, cruises. But, but this is, this is maybe, thank you for saying that, because this is reminding me of one thing that I wanted to bring up earlier that I forgot to bring up, and which I find so important, because when you, you, you were mentioning the, the kind of in a side sentence, he said something along the lines of the bioregional story starts with the, the, the um, American kind of boom of bioregionalism in the, in the 70s. The, um, I, I found that in the last eight months, if I had to summarize something that it's not that I wasn't thinking this before, but I wasn't saying it as clearly and I was keeping this, why are people still not 
framing it this way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I realized that it's because I wasn't clear enough about it. Um, for me, if we don't anchor regeneration, not as the sort of, oh, you're still working on sustainability, you're so out, um, haven't you heard about regeneration yet? And that's what we need. And let me show you how to do it. Um, I actually think that the double anchor right now where we're, where we're finally getting to the point of understanding that we need to learn how to be a place sourced culture custodian of place in a regional context. And that obviously will invite us to talk to those people who have learned, who have, have managed to, to keep that practice alive over 500 years of oppression, which is a lot of indigenous people around the globe. Yeah. And at the same time, we see a potential of another story of separation opening up, the deepening of understandable trauma cost um, pain in indigenous cultures that, that is actually deepening the injured indigeneity versus non-indigeneity problem, which is part of the root problem why we invented the economy that we're talking about as the root problem. So it's actually deeper than it's yeah. the economy stupid, it's the worldview stupid. Yeah. And, and the, the worldview is such that it separates indigenous and non-indigenous. And we can only heal it in our narrative from the start, in our linguistic framing of the entire story, if we anchor indigeneity with life. Yes. And if we anchor bioregionalism with the human story of how as the most cooperative species on the bloody planet, not the most competitive one, yeah. we have evolved as bioregional caretakers for 99% of our journey. We wouldn't be here. I'm, I'm an evolutionary biologist. I can swear to you, a species that doesn't know how to do that wouldn't walk around and have this conversation right now. And the fact that we spent 8,000 years on a detour, yeah. evolution laughs about. That's yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's just, because, just because we think that's a long time and our history books tell us that that's history and that's our story. The problem is we, we're starting the story too, too early, too, too late in the game. Yeah? And when we already thought we were separate from nature, we could be power over. Yeah? And so for me, it, it's no light, like, I mean, of course, and it brings up all sorts of dangers because if you overhark the point, then people go, oh, he's talking about going back to a golden past and, yeah, and then yeah. blah, blah, blah. But, but there is something really important about both understanding that bioregional regeneration is nothing new and that that's the pattern we need to fit yeah. back into or we're out. That's just, sorry, like life life yeah. just sets these conditions you choose. Yeah. Uh, and we can have a long conversation around it. The longer the conversation lasts, the less time we have to actually implement yeah. the, the solution pathways. Um, but the, the other bit for me is also to understand that regeneration itself, we can, we can go have a long conversation of whether it's Charlie Crone or Carol Sanford or Pamela Mang or whoever else and, and who started first and JT Lyle used the word and so did Bucky Fuller and what about um, Patrick Geddes and oh they're all white people that's ridiculous um, all indigenous nations around the globe knew how to live in alignment with the evolutionary pattern by which life creates conditions conducive to life and that's what we're talking about. And, and so how do we anchor our conversation around regeneration as regeneration is actually coming back to life's inherent impulse to generate and regenerate? And, and I, I, I had this discourse a few weeks ago, or maybe a couple of months ago, um, on, on some, I can't remember what podcast, webcast, or whatever it was. Mm. And somebody wrote to me afterwards. And it, sometimes it takes that just one little bit of feedback from somebody yeah. to really realize how powerful a framing is. And, yeah. and this lady just said, aligning with the regenerative pattern of life. Yeah. You wouldn't believe how that sentence landed in me. Suddenly, I believe I can do it because it's in me and it's not 
something out there that is some utopian hippie that waves his arm around a lot when he's on webcasts spouting stuff about. <laughs> Yeah. And, 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 and that, that really landed in me as, as a kind of a reminder to all of us and sharing it as this final kind of yeah. reflection of our conversation in a, in a way of that's what we all try to do. And that's what we sometimes get hit over the head of, around in our own lives that get out of your own way, let life walk through you, like pass through you, do its service through you and, and, and you will be taken care of. And um, yeah, well, that we get there. I mean, we could open a whole new conversation at this we point. We <laughs> will still be talking tomorrow. Um, but there, there is something in here that is really deeply important to explore. So maybe another time we'll do that. And that is when you put life at the heart of as a, a, a process that is not something you can construct, not something that you can, can design, that's been happening uh, along this pattern for 3.8 billion years, um, there's also a question of faith that comes up, um, which is incredibly important in this journey because it, there is so much that we can prove. There is so much technology around us. But ultimately, there's also a question of faith in the process of life, mm -hmm. that life does create the conditions conducive to life. If you can just let go enough of your deeply ingrained desire to control, predict, shape, that we have been doing for, let's give it a thousand years, maybe, 2000 years, maybe, of our 240,000 year existence as Homo sapiens. Um, when I listen to indigenous people talk about wholeness, for example, that there is something about a forest uh, that just is, that has a liveness, that just is, that you, you, you don't need to even break down into its component parts to understand uh, and anatomize what that's all about. There is something about it that just is, that is uniquely alive and of itself, that asks you to step into a very different, way of knowing that has faith at the heart. But, yeah, this is, um, this is so important, like whether it's an issue of faith or whether it's an issue of beholding context, the sacred, the, the wider, yeah. what we are part of in a- Faith might be in, the wrong word. In, in it, it, for some people it might be awe, some people it might be reverence, yeah. some, but, but it yeah. is ultimately for me, if we, instead of describing it, what does it produce? But it produces humility. Yes. And if we don't have that, we fuck the whole thing up. Like the, 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 the good people who hear the aligning with life's regenerative impulse in the Bay Area say, yeah, let's become a biohacker and like get better at the game and, and just become super game bionic game. humans. Yeah? And that's not getting the humility part yeah. of complexity, of, of understanding that no, 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 no. Now you're messing at a level that, you, yeah. I mean, that's where, if you want to put it in 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 kind of Christian terms, that's where no mortal shall meddle with these yeah. Yeah. dark arts. <laughs> yeah. So when I say faith, I'm not talking about something vaguely, even vaguely religious. It's about uh, knowing by un, unknown knowing. Mm intuitive uh something in in intuitive but, that we lost in the story of separation okay like the, we could we could go on forever but, I know. But this is, we this must is, stop because but, but, i'm but, sure you've got work to do but, but there, yeah. not, not at this time of night it's, it's i know it's, i made a list of things we were going to talk about i don't think we've talked about any of them but nevertheless oh, i think we talked most of them if you, i'll send it to you we'll almost cover most of them but in a different <laughs> way. covered life <laughs> but, but, but just as a last thought of, of this, how do, how do you, this, this direct knowing, um, 
that's for me also something that I, I haven't got a polished discourse on yet, but increasingly, and I learned this through being out in the garden, yeah. is the information is there, mm -hmm. but it is in the whole system. And that's why pattern language, pattern recognition is so important. Yeah. It's all like the supercomputer we're trying to build. Is already built. Is already built. It's yeah. life. It's the planetary biophysical transforming biosphere that is cosmically connected from yeah. outside of this solar system to the entire story. <laughs> and and yeah, in, in all of that, there is so much information, so much energy, so much potential. And we think we can just sort of break a few bits off and build them together it's again like Lego blocks and then build an alternative and call it whatever meta or whatever Zuckerberg is. Uh, anyway, oh, oh, let's no, 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 definitely not go there. Um, let's, I really, okay. yeah. But anyway, this was okay. really lovely. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we finally recorded this. Yeah, and, no, really and, good. Really thank, good. Thank you so much. And, and um, I'm looking forward to um, joining the, the learning journey you, you start at the Great. power of place. All and, good. Um, All good. You will, you, you will be welcomed and you will be greatly appreciated for whatever time you can give them the cohort, I know. So, and and one, one day the, the times will come for a hike in the Tramontana together. Um, I know, yeah, yeah. no, that will, that will come. Yeah. Uh, so far, we'll just have to put up with a couple of hikes from the Copt back to Schumacher. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Lots of love. Bye -bye. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.